In Canada, people are rarely infected with brucella. In this figure here, you can see the annual incidence of human brucellosis, so the number of people who were affected per 100,000 population over time. And this particular chart goes all the way back to 1928 and up to the late 2000s. Um, so historically, we had a fair number of cases. From the mid-1940s through the 1950s, there was a really precipitous drop-off in the incidence of disease in people. And I'd like you all to just pause the video for a minute and think about what might have happened during that time. Yeah, food safety. So there is a clue on the right-hand side of the slide here. This is a, a beautiful painting that I had the opportunity to see in Chandigarh um, called Milking the Cow. And what happened in Canada during this period is that pasteurization became a legal requirement. So we pasteurized the milk, we killed any organisms that were present, and you can see on this figure the tremendous impact on public health that this had. In this figure here, so just from 2002 to 2021, you can see the number of cases we have annually, uh, somewhere between uh, 5 and 15. And at present, most of these cases are travel associated. So brucellosis is typically not domestically acquired in Canada. Brucella suis has never been reported in pigs in Canada. Um, this is, again, oftentimes a reproductive disease. In sows, we see infertility, abortions, and potentially fetal mummifications. And in boars, we see orchitis, um, so swelling, uh, infection, and potentially necrosis of the testicles. We can also see bony involvement, leading to lameness, arthritis, or even discospondylitis. Similar clinical signs would be seen in pigs infected with either Brucella abortus or melatensis as well. Transmission of this organism is generally through the introduction of infected animals into the herd or through artificial insemination with contaminated semen. It's important to know that we potentially have wildlife reservoirs of Brucella suis, um, primarily rats and wild hare. So maintaining uh, biosecurity and preventing contact between wildlife um, and domestic species can be really important. In these images here, you can see just how enlarged an affected testicle will be. So on the left, we have a pig with Brucella suis, and you can see this testicle here is massively enlarged compared to the other one. Um, when we look at these opened up, here we have our normal testicle on the left, and the massively enlarged Brucella suis infected testicle on the right. So the lesions are very, very profound and very uh, recognizable. In Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency works really hard to keep our domestic herd brucella free. And this is a complex and sort of multi-pronged approach, including import controls, so we prevent introduction of animals or animal products from endemic regions. There's ongoing surveillance to detect positives as early as possible before it has time to transmit. Investigating any suspect cases, so doing epidemiological traceouts to identify any other in-contact animals. Depopulation, where all infected and exposed animals will be humanely destroyed. Decontaminating any infected premises. And then performing enhanced surveillance once a previously infected premise is restocked. So monitoring those animals to confirm the absence of the pathogen. In Canada, we do have two possible uh, local wildlife reservoirs of several Brucella species, Brucella abortus in Bison and Wood Buffalo National Park, as I mentioned. And then we also have Rangiferin brucellosis. So this is Brucella suis biovar 4 um, in Arctic caribou. Brucella canis is entirely another story. Um, Canada is not Brucella canis free. Um, and in recent years, we've actually seen globally the emergence of Brucella canis, um, oftentimes associated with uh, the importation of dogs by international rescue agencies. So this paper here is hot off the press. It was just accepted for publication um, about two weeks ago, as at the time of filming this. And it describes how Brucella has really emerged in Europe and how it's becoming more common. Just like in our ruminant species, Brucella canis is oftentimes a reproductive issue. We see bitches aborting dead fetuses, um, and you should suspect Brucella in any abortion that occurs 
two weeks before term. So late term abortions um, should really raise red flags for you. Rucella canis is most easily identified and more commonly identified in uncastrated males. And the reason for this is just like we saw with the pigs, they have huge testicles. The testicles are typically not painful, although you may see a secondary dermatitis um, due to the animal um, licking at the testicles. This isn't something that's thought to be due to pain, but it's more sort of the space occupying effect of having this very uncomfortably large uh, testicle. We can also see osteomyelitis and discospondylitis, so infection and inflammation of the bones or vertebral bodies. And uveitis and ocular disease is oftentimes seen in chronic infections. In this image on the left, you can see vertebral discospondylitis, so these sort of uh, inflammatory coalescing lesions between vertebral bodies. And on the right, we have anterior uveitis, secondary to a chronic Brucella canis infection. Brucella canis will be shed by intact females during estrus, and high numbers of organisms are present in aborted pups. So this serves as a potential reservoir to infect other animals and also presents potentially a zoonotic risk. In infected males, we see brucella in seminal fluid and urine, and it's been reported that they can shed it intermittently for up to two years. Treatment of these infections is, again, challenging. They are intracellular, so getting enough drug to the site of infection is an issue. Um, no treatment is 100% effective, and animals should never be assumed to be cured. Um, treatment oftentimes relies on drugs like streptomycin, tetracyclines, and enrofloxacin. Following resolution of the acute disease, um, any intact males should then be neutered. And any animal who has tested positive for brucella should never be bred. Recently, we've seen the emergence or the recognition of a new species of brucella, brucella inopanata. This one is associated with ectothermic organisms like frogs and toads, which is quite different than the endotherms, the mammals, primarily ruminants that we've associated brucella with in the past. Um, this very recent paper um, describing infections in a white's tree frog reported excoriations on the skin and granulomatous inflammation um, on the thighs and abdomen, which you can see here. Unlike our other Brucella species, we don't yet have an appreciation of the magnitude of zoonotic risk associated with Brucella inopanata. When dealing with either brucellosis or tularemia, samples must be handled with caution. Um, gloves are essential, and in suspect Francisella cases, I would recommend double gloving. Respiratory protection is also a good idea, and recapping needles is an absolute no-no. Do not do this. For Francisella, you want to collect swabs from ulcers or wounds um, and store them in special media with charcoal. This will allow them to remain viable for a longer period of time and facilitate culture. You can also send tissues or even whole animals to the lab so that they can be frozen. Um, whole animals frozen at sort of minus 30 to minus 70 degrees will allow culture in the future and confirmatory testing. We can also collect blood for serology to identify antibodies to Francisella, um, confirming exposure. For Brucella species, the samples you want to collect really depend on the clinical presentation. In cases of abortion, the whole fetus is really our sample of choice. Otherwise, send the fetal stomach, um, fetal lesions, cotyledons, or any uterine discharges. Histological examination of fetal tissues is also very useful, so fetal tissues fixed in formalin are a reasonable choice. In cases of orchitis, um, testing the ejaculate or tissues from castrated animals. Lymph nodes, always very useful. And of course, milk to detect shedding from lactating animals. With arthritis and discospondylitis, the sample collected is really going to depend on what species you're dealing with and what you're able to do. So aspirates, swabs, necropsy collected tissues, or potentially uh, surgical biopsies will all be useful. If you suspect either one of these organisms, you absolutely must make sure to tell the lab. 
These are amongst the most commonly contracted laboratory acquired infections, and they present a very real risk to laboratory workers. So make a notation on the form, Brucella suspect or Francisella suspect. That is very, very important. For Francisella, the organism can be cultured. Um, we can also do cytology on smears from lesions, immunohistochemistry, serology, um, or PCR. The patient history is going to be really important to select these laboratory tests. So again, talking about the course of disease, where the lesions are, if the animal has, if the cat or dog, for instance, has a known exposure to a rabbit, all really, really important. For brucella, serology is most common. Um, culture is certainly the gold standard, but because this is a level three organism, we don't like to do propagative tests in low containment level facilities. PCR is certainly possible, as are a variety of agglutination-based tests. When testing animals for exposure to brucella species, it's really important that you're aware that we can have false reactors. So false positive reactions can occur due to cross-reactivity of antibodies to other organisms, most commonly Yersinia enterocolitica. So a positive test doesn't necessarily mean it's positive, but it means that a confirmatory test is required. In this image here, what we're looking at is cytology of fetal abomasal content, so that fetal stomach, a great place to identify the etiology uh, which was responsible for the abortion. And what you can see here are these small uh, gram-negative coccobacilli. Um, this slide, again, is part of an archival collection. Um, we have now eradicated this organism from the domestic herd. So this dates back uh, several decades. Both of these genera are very important zoonoses. Um, Brucella infections in people are really challenging to diagnose. They can have a long incubation period from a week to three months and have a wide spectrum of presentations. Um, oftentimes it presents as a chronic nonspecific type disease so fever, chills, malaise, severe headache, myalgias, and potentially lymphadenopathy. We can see cutaneous or vascular diseases, so rashes uh, and thrombosis. The classical presentation is undulant fever. So this is a waxing and waning fever where for two to three weeks, you'll have a fever at night, feel really horrible, and then be normal thermic during the day. That's followed by a period of normal thermia, feeling good, and then the cycle repeats. Fever at night, feel okay during the day, again and again and again. We can also see foci of infection and separation, so abscesses in joints or the viscera. Human brucellosis is a really important disease. It's estimated that globally there's about 500,000 cases per year, and it's most commonly associated with unpasteurized dairy products. Brucella melitensis and abortus are the most common, and you should be aware of this organism when you're traveling. Because this is most commonly a foodborne infection, you need to be careful about what you're eating in endemic countries. In North America, uh, hunters or people who are potentially exposed to wild animals that may have brucella need to take precautions. So the CDC recommends uh, personal protective equipment, including rubber gloves, goggles, face shields, and gowns. You can find more information about uh, zoonotic brucella at the CDC website uh, with the link here. The zoonotic risk associated with brucella canis is lower compared to brucella abortus, melitensis, or suis, but there is still a risk and you should still handle any potentially infected patients with caution. Um, veterinarians, or those in contact with abortuses are at greatest risk, as are laboratory workers. So again, make sure you point out that you suspect this being a brucella case. As I mentioned earlier, there's been an increase in the incidence of brucella canis in uh, North America and also Western Europe that we think is associated with uh, the importation of rescue dogs from more highly endemic countries. So we have a few interesting, more recent reports. Uh, this one from Ontario, Canada in December 2020, not specifically looking at rescue dogs, but highlighting the increased incidence. And then this case of human brucella canis in the Netherlands from just uh, 2022. 
Like I said, brucella is a possible laboratory acquired infection. So this is a very real risk. Make sure to fill out those lab requisition forms. Brucella abortus, melatensis, and suis are potential biological weapons. And so as future, future veterinarians, um, your ability to identify these infections could play a role not only in animal health and public health, but potentially national security. And then we have emerging novel species in marine mammals, voles, and ectotherms, where we really don't have uh, a good sense of how big of a hazard these present. Human infections are rarely reported with these atypical brucella species, but if I was working with an animal suspected to be infected, I would use the same type of personal protective equipment as I would dealing with a brucella abortus positive cow. Human infections can be successfully treated. Um, prolonged antimicrobial therapy is required, and one protocol that I read about suggested oral tetracycline for six weeks followed by daily IM injections of streptomycin for two to three weeks. So dealing with these infections and clearing them up is certainly a non-trivial matter, and it's much better to prevent them in the first place. I have just a couple of uh, new terms today, and then some questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.